Hello and welcome to this week's Macker to Macker. Today we've got a really exciting lineup of guests for you on our program. If this is your first time here, a very warm welcome to you. And if you've been following them all, an even warmer welcome to you. My name's Jackie Kay. I'm the third modern macker. The term macker means the national poet of Scotland. I followed Liz Lockhead and Edwin Morgan. If Edwin had lived, he would have been 100 on the 27th of April this year. Well, the idea behind this series is to pass the baton on in a kind of really lovely way. Macker to macker, maker to maker. The nearest English equivalent for the word macker is maker. It just means poet or bard, but it's not exclusively Scottish. Chaucer was referred to as a macker by Dunbar. So we pass the baton every week, macker to macker, and have a lovely, rich and heady mix of poetry and song. Tonight, we've got the wonderful Val McDermott, and we've got the absolutely fantastic Claire Brown. But before I introduce you to both of them, I'm going to read a wee poem to kick us off. This poem is called Something Rhymed, and I wrote it for my dear, wonderful friend, Ali Smith. I was driving around the border country, and I was thinking about the beauty of all the different names. And I was also thinking about Gilbert O'Sullivan, uh, that we both love. Something rhymed. You're a gem, you're a holy cairn, you're a clattering shawl, you're a tongueland bridge, you're a Solway fir, you're a big water of fleet, you're an old song, you're a valley. This feeling inside me could never deny me. You're a red deer of the forest, you're a wild goat of the moor, you're a bladnock malt, a whit worn story, you're a friend, you're a glory, nothing old, nothing new, nothing ventured. Oh, you are definitely, so completely, the brightest girl of the glen. You're a bee's wing. You sing in a voice like a fresh water spring. Nothing older than time, nothing sweeter than wine. You are my Pinwherry, you're my Loch Doon and Galloway. You're my gatehouse of fleet. You are philosophical, all loose bay and wopso. Nothing I couldn't say. So I would like to welcome into our Zoom room, from my living room to their living room to her living room, Val McDermott. Hello. Hello, Val. And Claire Brown. Hello, Claire. Good evening. Hello there. Well, it's really lovely to, to see you both. How are you both doing? Pretty well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's been a beautiful day today, so that always cheers me up. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, doing pretty well. I think writers are well suited to lockdown in many ways because we spend much of our life sitting by ourselves looking at a screen or looking at an empty sheet of paper so we've been coping pretty well yeah yes yeah. not too much has changed <laughs> not too much has changed for us um well claire claire brown uh, is a, got an amazing singing voice while you're in for you're in for a treat um she trained as an actress at guildhall She's been in several plays in the Royal Exchange Theatre, in the Bush Theatre for the Royal Shakespeare Company. She's appeared on television in Mary Queen of Scots and all sorts of other programmes. She's a, a really dear friend um, and she's just got such a lovely voice. <laughs> she's going to kick us off with a wonderful song called The Dancing. Can you tell us a wee bit about this song, Claire? Oh, well, I've, um, I've loved this song um, for years. And um, when I heard that uh, Val was coming on Macker to Macker, I thought it would be a great opportunity to sing it because um, it's, it's set in Kirkcaldy. Um, and I'd always really lazily attributed it to um, June Tabor, whose recording I'd always, I'd always known. But when I looked a wee bit deeper, um, I saw that it was actually written by... Um, my secondary school uh, English teacher. <laughs> wow. and, um, <laughs> so I was like, I know that name. Oh my God, right. So, um, so I, I delved a wee bit further, got in touch with them and, and the story behind the song is, is, is wonderful. They went into an old folks home and this woman is um, Mary, who was 101 years old and he'd expected her to be talking about the lino and, and the, you know, the, the, the smell that's in Kirkcaldy. And um, I lived in Kirkcaldy for three years as well. And, um, and she talked about the dancing because no matter what's going on, the dancing's the dancing. And so th this is for Val, who's obviously a fifer. 
that's lovely. And what was your English teacher's name? What was he called? I'm so sorry. Yeah, of yeah. course. Um, his name is Andy Shanks, and he's a, an absolutely wonderful folk musician and singer. I mean, his his stuff is really incredible, and um, and I, I got in contact with him this week, and and he's um, he was very very generous um, in in his reply. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. Do you remember him vividly when you were at school? You know that way that English do, teachers, in particular, for some reason, we seem to remember more than others. Yeah, I do remember him very vividly because I won an onomatopoeia competition and I got a Mars <laughs> bar out of him because um, I won that in second year. And um, but also, what I remember is he—he, he, I, I didn't expect him to remember me at all. It was uh, really unremarkable. But I remember him setting out the boat. For the ancient mariner and he was up on the desk and at the time he was playing his guitar and I didn't I didn't know at that time he was a he was a folk singer but I remember the way he taught was very very physical and that's subsequently what I've always responded really well to so so really getting it in your body and your head so um, uh, that, that's yeah, lovely. It's wonderful oh fantastic well let's hear it let's hear it there okay Saturday night at the Adam Smith Hall, the couples all moved to the dance master's call. Tonight they've no problems, no worries at all. The dancing, the dancing tonight. But oh, Monday morning, she comes round too soon. The sound of the flax mill, the beat of the loom. But tonight the band's playing a romantic tune. The dancing, the dancing's tonight. Her partner is perfect, he's light on his feet. The footwork is faultless. Perhaps they might meet up by the old kirk or down Hunter Street, walking home under the stars. But oh, Monday morning, she comes round too soon. The sound of the flax mill, the beat of the loom. But tonight, the band's playing a romantic tune. The dancings, the dancings tonight. Walking back late by Kirkcaldy Sea Wall. The sea looks so big, the sky is so tall. The fate of two people can't matter at all. Just waltz in three quarter time. But oh, Monday morning, she comes round too soon. The sound of the flax mill, the beat of the loom. But tonight the band's playing a romantic tune. The dancings, the dancings tonight. Saturday night at the Adam Smith Hall, the couples all move to the dance master's call. Tonight they've no problems, no worries at all. The dancing, the dancing's tonight. Oh wow, that was just beautiful. What a fantastic song. It's expressed, it, it's particularly poignant, uh, thinking of the story behind that song and thinking about people's lives, that people's lives are, are punctuated by, by dance and by music and that defines us. And that when, we, when our memories start to fail, the, the, we don't forget the dance, the dance is still in the body, the song is still in our head. These things are the kind of the last, the last to go. And that, that, that reminded me of that that particular way that the way that the body can hang on to a dance yeah. long after the, the mind um, might have forgotten the name, your own name even. Um, Val, how did you enjoy that song? 
I loved it. I loved it. I've, I've always loved that song ever since I first heard it because, of course, it's set in Kirkcaldy and there's not that many songs about Kirkcaldy. You know, there's Georgie Monroe and there's the Beatles singing about the Duchess of Kirkcaldy. But it's particularly, I find it particularly poignant because my parents used to go out dancing. Uh, that was their big weekly outing. Uh, they went to the dancing uh, and they loved it. My, my, they, were, they were lovely dancers. My dad was a, a beautiful light-footed dancer and my mum, on the dance floor, they, 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 they were changed, they were transformed. And it had a benefit for me as well because that was the night I got sent to stay at my grandparents every week. So I got to spend time with my grandparents by the sea at East Weems and they got to go out and have a night without having to worry about getting home for the bairn. <laughs> well that's a that's a lovely story and um, i'm this is the wonderful val mcdermott and i'm just going to introduce you there's absolutely no real reason to introduce you because you're 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 known and beloved to so many people all over the world and um, val has written so many different wonderful crime books she's sold over 60 million copies of her books around the world, they're translated into over 40 languages, which is one of these, as you'll see, as this programme evolves, um, one of these multi-talented people. She's got a huge, vast general knowledge. She's won Mastermind uh, and University Challenge, or Team One University Challenge. And she went to Oxford, St Hilda's College. She was the first kid from a state school uh, to go to Oxford. And she's got, she's got a vast intelligence, but also a vast empathy for people. She's really interested in forensic, she's interested in poetry, she's interested in history, she's interested in music and song and she's also a dear dear friend of mine and one of the most touching things that's happened to me in these last few years is that Val, every time her mum's ended up in hospital for a spell, Val's made her her own wee video <laughs> singing singing songs and I've gone into the hospital with headphones and they've got passed around the ward and somebody said one time, is that, know that lassie that writes these crime books? Why, she's got an awful sweet voice for a, for a woman that's into murder. <laughs> <laughs> so I bet that's the strangest introduction that you've ever had. But welcome to the Zoom room to Macker, to Macker, Val McDermott. It's a great <laughs> honour to be considered a Macker among yeah. Mackers. Well, you are a Macker, aren't you? And, and do you feel, because you're, you're, you're writing is a craft and you, you'd have to learn such a lot to, to become a writer of crime. I mean, it, it's such an extraordinary genre, an interesting genre, and you spent a long time, didn't you, being a journalist before you turned to being a crime writer? Yeah, I was a journalist for about 15 years, but really the thing I always wanted to do was to write fiction. And I, I always felt that the, the day job was what I did until I could make a living writing novels. Um, I tried writing you know, literary fiction, but I was absolutely rubbish at it. Um, and so I turned to crime because I'd always read a lot of crime fiction and I loved it. And I thought, this is a genre that I understand what I'm supposed to be doing, so maybe I should give that a try. Um, and I feel this is, I've just sent off my 34th novel to my publisher. I think I've kind of got the hang of it now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and still, still Life will be out in the 20th of August, won't it, for, for people that are waiting? But still Life and I'm still learning. Uh-huh. And what do you find surprising? Do you find that every novel you, you know in advance is structured? Do you find the structure of it a puzzle or a surprise? Do you ever have real problems with, with finding a way into the structure of the book? Yeah, the structure is always the key. You might have a great idea, you might have a great story, but until you find the structure, how to tell that story, it's nothing. It's, it's just a bunch of, of unrelated bits and pieces that need a voice. And that's, I, th I think, often the key to an idea you've had kicking around for a long time is how you get the structure right. Sometimes it comes quite quickly. Other times it takes literally years. I think my record was 12 years from having a really clear idea of what the story was to finding a way to tell it that made sense. I wrote the, the first 10,000 words of that, that book five times before I finally got the right voice. And can I just say at this point, and this is not me being a souk, but one of the things <laughs> that broke the log jam for me with that book was reading your novel, Trumpet. And oh. the, the way you structured the storytelling in that, I thought I learned something from that. I thought I could do something similar to that in places in this book. So, you know, a belated thank you for doing that for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's nice. I love that word, souk. It's funny how words take you straight back to your to your childhood. And do you ever feel like when you, because 
when you write and you and you set off again every time it's like a fresh new thing isn't it every time there's a fresh terror so even though you've written 34 novels and and sold millions of them it's interesting to me that we still feel fresh to the, the page there's something shy um in us to to our, to our writing we fear that we might lose uh, have lost something all the time what do you think that's about psychologically why do you think we do that to ourselves as writers so we just all you know I think it's part of what drives us isn't it it's the challenge if we didn't have that sense of self-doubt what would be the point if we were so sure that we'd got the hang of it, why bother? If it wasn't a journey of exploration, why would you, why would you continue? I remember um, someone interviewing William Golding on the, on the radio once years and years ago, uh, saying, and you must feel tremendous relief when you finish a novel. And he said, no, I feel a sense of panic, a sense of, will I ever be able to do this again? Mm -hmm. And in my own experience, the very first time I met Ruth Rendell, I mean, I was a baby writer, and Ruth Rendell was one of my heroes. And, you know, what do you say after you've said, I think you're amazing and I love your books? You know, and, mm -hmm. and I said, I suppose when you've written as many books as you have, it gets easier. And she looked at me as if I was very stupid and said, no, dear, it gets harder. <laughs> I didn't entirely understand that at the time, but I certainly understand it now because that drive to make an incremental improvement book to book is quite difficult. Yeah, but but you've, got to feel, you... you've got to grab the challenge, haven't you? Absolutely. And do you feel because Ruth Rendell then uh, invented Barbara Vine and wrote A Dark Adapted Eye to give herself a different way of, of approaching crime and, and you have different characters, different sets of characters that give you a whole different feel to your to your books. Do you feel that that's a similar thing that you're doing when you when you have a whole different new cast? I've got a restless imagination. I couldn't just write one series with one character. I mean, I admire people that do things like, you know, remember, Sue Grafton starting off with A is for Alibi, knowing there's like another 25 to go. I mean, I can't do that. Um, and I can't write two books with the same characters back to back because I get bored. Uh, so for me, there's always a, a, a need to do things differently. And, and I'm very grateful to Ruth Rendell for her career in showing publishers that you can go in different directions and write different kind of books and still take your readers with you. It's not the end of the world. Um, and so right from the start, I guess, I've always, I've always varied my output. To t which allows me always to be excited about what I'm writing. So every time I sit down, I'm writing something that, that I really want to tell. It's not sort of sitting down on the 1st of January and going, oh God, here we go, another Detective Inspector grumpy. Uh, it's, <laughs> not, it's, not, it's not that freshness. Yeah, they feel really, really fresh, fresh to me. And also you learn, I learn, you learn such a lot reading them. You learn such a lot about forensics and you, I mean, you, you're really a forensic specialist yourself. You've written a whole book on forensics as well. And you, you must find that whole business of, of crime scenes and clues totally and utterly fascinating. I do, but I mean, I have to say, you know, really, I'm, I'm a bit of a charlatan. I'm a bit of a dilettante. You know, I know things for as long as I have to write a particular book and then they disappear into the mists. I'm very lucky I've got a whole bunch of forensic scientists that I've got to know over the years who are very generous with their time and their information and, and uh, keep me right out there sort of at the leading edge, sometimes too close to the leading edge. I remember uh, Sue Black telling me a really fascinating bit of forensic information one time and I was so excited by it, I put it in the next book. And she mm -hmm. rang me up and said, you might have waited till I'd published the paper. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. Well, you've got a great love of, of poetry, as as you do as well, Claire, don't you? You you love poems, and uh, and we're going to now hear. This is the first time that we've done this in Macker to Macker, so it's very exciting to talk about fresh new fresh new things to do in the program. It's the first time that we've had a person who's not a poet read poems, and it's just really lovely that poetry means so much to so many different people in all sorts of different ways. So I wonder, Val, if you'd read us your first couple of choices of poems and maybe tell us why you why you've picked them. Sure. Uh, the first one I've chosen uh, is, is from a book of Liz Lockhead's. It's Liz Lockhead's first book, Memo for Spring, which came out in 1972, which was the year I went to Oxford. But earlier in the year, when, when the book came out, a friend of mine gave it to me as a birthday present. And it blew me away because I had never read modern poetry written in the kind of language that I heard around me in the streets. Uh, it, it was a voice that was, it was, it was a voice I could completely identify with and yet it was poetry as well. Uh, I'd read a lot of poetry in my teens. I, I, I wrote bits and pieces of poetry, adolescent poetry as we often do in our teens, um, uh, which 
uh, no one will ever see now. <laughs> um, but finding Liz's voice was, was a tremendous uh, excitement to me. And uh, this particular poem, The Choosing, also uh, resonated for me because, you know, I was, I was the one who was going off to Oxford and, and uh, doing all these exciting things. Uh, and not everybody that I'd grown up with, that I was friends with, had the same experience. So this is The Choosing. We were first equal, Mary and I, with same coloured ribbons and mouse coloured hair. With equal shyness, we curtsied to the lady councillor for copies of Collins' children's classics. First equal, equally proud. Best friends too, Mary and I. Common bond in being cleverest, equal, in our small school's small class. I remember the competition for top desk or to read aloud the lesson at school service and my terrible fear of her superiority at sums. I remember the housing scheme where we both stayed, same houses, different homes, where the choices were made. I don't know exactly why they moved, but anyway, they went. Something about a three apartment and a cheaper rent. But from the top deck of the high school bus, a glimpse amongst the others on the corner, Mary's father, muffled, contrasting strangely with the elegant greyhounds by his side. He didn't believe in high school education, especially for girls or in forking out for uniforms. Ten years later on a Saturday, I am coming from the library, sitting near me on the bus, Mary, with a husband who is tall, curly haired, has eyes for no one else but Mary. Her arms are round the full shaped vase that is her body. Oh, you can see where the attraction lies in Mary's life. Not that I envy her, really. And I am coming from the library with my arms full of books, I think of those prizes that were ours for the taking and wonder when the choices got made we don't remember making. That's a lovely, lovely, lovely poem for all sorts of reasons. And the second poem I'm going to read now is another Scottish woman, Violet Jacob. This obviously is from a, a different era. Uh, and I've chosen a poem of Violet Jacob's called The Wild Geese. And I love this poem in particular because it's a poem about exile. It's about not being where you belong. And I suppose I also uh, have a sneaking fondness for it too, because it, it refers to the part of Scotland where I grew up, the Firth of Forth, around Fife. The Wild Geese. Oh, tell me what was on your road, you roaring northern wind, as you come blowing through the land that's never free my mind. My feet, they travel England, but I'm dying for the north. My man, I heard the siller tides run up the fifth of four. I wind, I came them well enough, and fine they fall and rise, and fain I'd feel the creeping mist on yonder shore that lies. But tell me, ere you passed them by, what saw you on the way? My man, I rocked the roving gulls that sail up in the tay. But saw you Nathan lay in wind afore you come to Fife. There's muckle lying yont the tay that's mere to me nor life. My man, I swept the Angus Bridge you hadn't trod for years. Oh, wind, for gi a hameless loon that cannot see for tears. And far abin the Angus Strats, I saw the wild geese flee. A long, long skein of beaten wings with their heads towards the sea. And I, their crying voices trailed, I hint them on the air. Oh, wind, hey mercy, hod your quest, for a dawn will listen mare. So in our house, uh, Burns was the, the great god. My dad was the lead tenor in the Bowhill People's Burns Club concert party. So there was always Burns songs going on in our house. And this is what I'm going to sing now. is one of my favourites. There's not but care on every hand In every hour that passes, oh What signifies the life, oh man And twere not for the lasses, oh Green grow the rushes, oh Green grow the rushes, oh, the sweetest hours that e'er I spent were spent among the lasses, oh. The worldly race may riches chase, and riches still may fly them, oh. And when at last they catch them fast, their hearts can ne'er enjoy them, oh. Green grow the rushes, oh, green grow the rushes, oh. The sweetest days that ever I spent were spent among the lasses, oh. 
Give me a can of routine. My arms are put material. Unworldly cares, unworldly men. May all gone top saltirio. Green grow the rushes, oh. Green grow the rushes, oh. The sweetest of the ice were spent spend. among the losses, oh. Old nature swears the lovely dears her noblest work she classes, oh. Her prentice horn she tried on man, and then she made the lasses, oh. Green grow the rushes, oh. Green grow the rushes, oh. The sweetest fur that her eyes spent were spent among the lasses, Oh, that was wonderful. Really, really wonderful. And it was just so interesting to get a chance to hear you both singing together um, with the wee tiny delay that, uh, that we have to have that's necessary when you're in the Zoom room. Uh, I remember I, I told my son we were thinking of doing this and he said, it wouldn't work unless they're singing Frere Jaca. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I thought it, I thought that really did work. I'm just going to read a, a, a poem of mine in in, res, in response to that. Val, that that lovely choice of Green Grove to Rashi's own. This is a poem that's inspired by by Burns, as you as you see. And uh, I wrote a series of poems to go with the sculpture that the wonderful Scottish artist Douglas Gordon did, the Black Burns. It was in the National Portrait Gallery, and I wrote a series of poems to go with his black marble burns that lay shattered on the floor of the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. Anyway, so this is called Bonnie Lassie. Bonnie Lassie, will you go? Will you go with me, Bonnie Lassie, oh? Will you hold me tightly, closely, and never let me go? And when the sun goes down and the moon is on the wane, will you ne'er grow weary, weary, oh? Bonnie Lassie, will you stay through all that's coming to greet us all? The loss, the grief, the wildernesses, the blank faces and the hot flushes, the bluter days, the haze, the blaze, old age, the dying light, the rage again it. Will you ne'er grow weary, weary oh? Bonnie Lassie, will you tack the squeeze of years, their weight, crack, and across the banks and braes, we mun donner, on and on, still through a winner, till the trees are bony and the bonny banks spill, my girl, across the corn rigs and barley, the unploughed fields, the green grown rashes, oh, will you ne'er grow weary, weary, oh. oh. I was really, I was really interested and and, and uh, overjoyed really to hear about the Bow Hill Burn Suffer Club and that experience that you had of going to burn suffers uh, all the time, Val. And did you have an experience like that, Claire, of going to burn suffers, or was that not something your family? No, took you to? no, no. We didn't do burn suffers, but at primary school we had the burns speaking competition. So, so you'd you'd stand there and you'd you'd learn your poem and you'd speak it as well. So I never won it. And I was really annoyed about that. My brother won it every year, practically. <laughs> I, feel a wee bit, I feel a wee bit miffed about that, to be honest. Um, yeah. Uh, I know I did Highland dancing, like I've, I've mentioned before, because <laughs> my mum did that, but no, no real regular burn supper things, no. I wish. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and how did you feel? Did you, you didn't get taken to them as a girl, Val. How, did you... No, no, really? my first burn suppers were actually ones at school, uh, when I was at a school burn supper. Um, but uh, now, of course, as, as, as the wheel turns, I'm now the honorary president of the Bowhill People's Burns Club. <laughs> <laughs> I, do get to, I do get to turn up and I'm always made welcome when there's always a, a wee glass of whiskey and, and a pie at half time. Uh, it's a lovely, it's a lovely atmosphere. And it's, uh, it's just ordinary working people, working men, who love the work of Burns and they meet and they sing songs and they recite uh, and they, it's something that clearly speaks to them deep in their hearts. I know that there's something that, that goes straight to the heart with Burns 
with the poetry of Burns and the songs of Burns, it takes you straight there, almost the, the, a fast circuit way, way to it. And it. It's extraordinary to think of the way that that has lasted over the years and the way that we keep reinventing ways of looking and ways of reading and ways of singing him. And it was interesting, the two poets that you picked there, Liz Lockhead and Violet Jacobs. Violet's in the Macker's Court and that wonderful poem that you read while Geese, Claire was actually thinking of singing one week, weren't you, Claire? Yeah, yeah, I felt I, I, it's really moving that you've, uh, uh, you, you spoke that, Val, because I, I come from Montrose, which is where which is where she comes from, and it's and the song that, that it, you know the music that was set to it was is just absolutely beautiful, and it's it's, it's an ambition to, to sing it really, and I think the poet poems just it hits the nail on the head, and I'm miles away from home as well right now, and it's uh, it just it gets you every single time. It's a great song of exile, yeah. I think. That's, but your 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 response, Jack, your response to Burns is is very moving. You you, you also capture that straight to the heart thing, and um, you know. The thing that, as I was listening to you reading that there or reciting that there, I I thought of your parents, your your mum and dad, and and over the years that I got to know them, and the 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 lovely way they were with each other and with the rest of us, and that real sense of of belonging with each other, uh, and that sense also of belonging within this culture, that was is so obvious every time you were with them. Oh, that's such a lovely thing to say. Really, really lovely. Oh gosh, it really moved me to tears. We had the most extraordinary um, experience going on the boat, didn't we, from 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 Collinsy yeah. to Oban um, with with my parents and 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 you, Val, and a whole number of other really wonderful writers. Some of whom you're actually now in a band with now, the, the fun loving crime writers. Yeah. Um, yes, and you played in. Glastonbury and all sorts of all sorts of places. Um, but I remember we just had this wonderful big sing song on the boat. Um, for that two and a half hour journey from Collinsy, and it made me think that that's the you know that is the reason that we that we live really to share song and to share enthusiasm and, and poems um, with, with people, and that was one of the reasons really for for inventing this program during this lockdown was to give people that kind of lift that they get when hearing a poem. And that those two poems and um, those first two poems go together beautifully well because they can kind of can say they c contain a duality, a dialogue with the wind in one, and then this kind of friendship dialogue across the years and those choices that you don't um, remember making, which is one of those lines that also goes right to you because it's so, so true that our, our life's choices get really affected by our parents. And that's something that I feel passionately about because, you know, I could have been brought up in an orphanage or I could have been adopted by Tories. <laughs> 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 and uh, and I shared that with with you that excitement about coming across Memo for Spring. I've got a first edition copy of it as well of that that just finding a voice that spoke in your own voice. You didn't have to speak in this distant in this distant voice. And Violet's interesting because she was I came from quite a wealthy and posh posh background, but she used Scott's dialogue um, in in her in her poetry a lot and liked being out in the farms. And out and in amongst people in the, in the in the in the farmland, so it's quite an interesting thing that whole relationship that these writers have with people, voice, and land. I think one of the things that, that any Scottish writer learns from from Scottish poetry is that we can speak with a hail voice. We don't have to be partial. We can be all that we are. Exactly. We can be absolutely all that we are. Well, we're going to go on now into our, into our next lovely um, part of the, of the programme. And you're going to read to us another couple of your choices, Val. Yes. Um, and uh, it's good that you were talking about Collinsey there, because one of the people that was on the boat that day in Collinsey with us on the sing song was Andrew Gregg. Uh, and I've, I've loved Andrew's poetry since I was a teenager. We're quite close in terms of age, so he was clearly, you know, a prodigy. Uh, he was publishing when I was still a teenager, uh, and I don't think he was much older. Uh, but uh, I've, I've become friends with some poets over the years, and Andrew's one of them. And uh, he wrote this poem for me. Uh, it was actually his, his birthday present to me on my 60th birthday, so it obviously is a poem that means a great deal to me. And it's called The Wild Shirt. The Wild Shirt to Val 
on her birthday. If life were a tropical shirt, it would bear no maker's name, no size, provenance or cleaning instructions, no symbols of any kind. The price tag's removed. After all, it is a present. Don't worry about the fit. However big you get, it just gets bigger. Put it on, friend. Any label you add now is your own work. We know the whole show ends in charity shops. Meanwhile, it's a crime not to shoot those gorgeous cuffs. The next poem I'm going to read is, uh, is by Robin Robertson. And I think Robin's poetry fits very well in the dark tradition of uh, of the murder ballads. He writes about, about darkness, he writes about difficulty, he writes about relationships, um, but some of his poems are just, uh, they just blow me away, They're extraordinary. He was uh, shortlisted for the Booker Prize a couple of years ago, I was one of the judges, and we all were blown away by his long narrative poem, The Long Take, and I would recommend that to you if you want a longer narrative poem, it's, it's a wonderful read. But this is a very short poem, and this is a short poem that I think makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And I think it's a short poem that tells a long story. It's called The Law of the Island. They lashed him to old timbers that would barely float with weights at the feet. So only his face was out of the water. Over his mouth and eyes, they tied two live mackerel with twine and pushed him out from the rocks. They stood then, smoking cigarettes and watching the sky, waiting for a gannet to read that flex of silver from a hundred feet up, close its wings and plummet dive. Oh, that, that poem, that last poem, absolutely takes your breath away. Mm. And, and it also reminds you that violence and poetry, um, that, that poets do explore violence um, in all sorts of different ways. And the idea of punishment and, and the history of punishment is just, just horrendous. It's so visual. It, it reminds me of the Twa Corbys that you yeah. often open with when you're, when you're singing with your band. Yeah, well, of course, that is very much in the tradition of the Scottish murder barrel of the Twa Corbys. And yeah, we, we always uh, open our gigs when I, I do that solo a cappella, and it certainly shuts the audience up. And then we go crashing into rock and roll. Uh, so it gives a flavour of the, the range of the kind of things that we do. We sing songs about crime and murder. But yeah, there, there is a, a long, strong tradition of, of poetry talking about the darkness as well. You know, a lot of people mistakenly think poetry is all, you know, daffodils and sunshine. But the best poetry, I think, often goes to, goes to the dark places that we can't access very easily otherwise. It allows us, I suppose, to experience feelings that, that maybe are not necessarily, we don't necessarily think are permissible. Absolutely. And those, those border ballads were so interesting because the border country itself captures different writers' imaginations in so many different ways. It's, it's mythical. It's spiritual. It's it can be creepy. There can be crimes committed on the on the border. That that kind of hinterland between mm. one thing and the other, and that's something that you really explore a lot in your work too. The idea of, of borders and of, of crossing over. Yeah, I think it's something that uh, a lot of Scottish writers are are interested in the idea of duality. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, it's what what uh, what Hugh McDermott called the Caledonian anti syzygy. <laughs> um, together of two opposing forces. So on the one hand, you've got the sort of, you know, the, the doer puritanical uh, obsession with the dark night of the soul. And on the other hand, you've got the sort of the, the, the music and the dancing and the, the, the Gallic side of ourselves. Um, and, and I think those, those elements fight within us. And a lot of the, the most interesting, uh, the tradition of Scottish fiction is about that duality, you know, going right back to Confessions of a Justified Sinner. And then you've got the echo of Confessions with, with uh, Jekyll and Hyde, uh, Stevenson, and and it's a theme that I think runs through a lot of a lot of uh, writing here in Scotland, and I think it's a, a theme that's very noticeable in Scottish crime fiction. A lot of us write about the other side, the underneath, the bit you don't see, the bit that people try to keep hidden, and that's fascinating. I think always. 
I know, because we grew up with a sense of that. I, mean, I remember my mum used to say, you never know what goes on behind four walls, Jackie. And there was always this, this idea that even your neighbours were hiding stories from you and that things were going on in the street that you would only be able to guess at. And there was a kind of an excitement at the idea as to what people might be hiding, you know, what, 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 what kind of things they were keeping secret. And, um, but in my family, things were out in the open, you know, it said, vote John Kay on a van. <laughs> and they, and they vote John Kay for Communist Party on the, on the Green Morris Minor. And then the registration plate was KGB. <laughs> 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 so, so it was really strange. I kind of partly, partly liked the idea of, of secrecy because we, we, we couldn't really be secret in, in any way. Um, and what about your family? Did you find them a, a secretive or an open family? Um, I don't think, I don't think, I genuinely don't think they had anything much to be secret about my parents. Um, they had, I mean, they had they were quite simple, straightforward people uh, and they had a, a very, a, a very devoted relationship with each other. Um, you know, they, they, they met when my mum was 14 and my dad was 15, uh, and that was that. They never went out with anybody else. Um, and, uh, you know, after my dad died, uh, my mum was, was a widow for 20 odd years, and she said, oh, I never looked at another man. Nobody could match up to your father. Uh, and I didn't really, uh, you know, the, the things that, uh, I, I mean, there may well be secrets that I don't know, and I never will know now because they're the only ones who could tell me and they're no longer with us. But I never had the I never had the sense that things were being kept from me, um, and certainly my father and I always, you know, argued vigorously throughout my teens about everything from sort of politics to society to music to everything really, apart from poetry, really. Uh, and your your dad never actually lived to see your first book come out, which makes makes me sad, you know, as as as, as your friend. But I I I like to kind of imagine how proud he would be um, of you if he was here. And do you find that um, when you lose a parent, you find a different way of keeping them with you in some way, that you, you adapt to living alongside the fact that they're not here and in a way that that becomes that they are here? Yeah, I mean, I, I still, I st I'm still very aware of my dad as a presence in my life. Um, you know, not in any sort of, you know, ghostly, otherworldly, oh, I feel it with me kind of way, but I'm just aware of, of his, his influence in my life, if you like, the things that, that I do, the things that I respond to, that I, I know uh, that I have those particular reactions because of the person he was and the person my mother was, that I understand those influences and how they have shaped me in a way that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have acknowledged when I was younger. I think that's something that you know, as we grow up and we start to have relationships with our parents as adults, we start to understand in a very different way how they've shaped us to be the persons that, the persons that we are, the, the, the views that we hold and, and the things that we value. And I, I, that's one of the great sadnesses for me. I mean, my dad died when, when I was 32 uh, and I just felt that I'd really started to have a relationship with him as a grown up. Uh, and there was so much more to explore that we never got the chance to uncover Mm, yeah, that's that's really uh, that is hard. Um, it's really really hard. And but but I get such a sense, a strong sense of your dad. Though I did, didn't meet him, I get such a strong sense of him from you and from the way that you you sing when you sing the Road to Dundee or when you sing these songs. I even get a sense of what his singing voice might have been been like and his personality. And that's all conveyed just through you being you being you. And I, I find that really utterly fascinating. How much how much we make people present that are absent and that we do that almost in, instinctively. People do it in very different ways by telling stories or but, but, but by keeping people around us in some way or another. And supporting Wraith Rovers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. You've got a whole football stand. Okay. Yeah, you've got a whole football. So you went to football with your dad as a wee girl. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, he, was a, he was a football scout. He was a scout for Wraith Rovers. He'd wanted to be a professional footballer himself, but he got TB in the bone when he was uh, in his late teens, and so that put paid to that. But he became a scout for Wraith Rovers, and so he would take me with him when he was on uh, scouting missions at the weekends. I think it was mostly to get me out of the way of my mother, you know, so she could get some peace and quiet to get the bacon done. Um, but I mean, he, was, he was quite a, a, a figure in, in, that, uh, in that world of uh, Fife football. He... He's the man who discovered Jim Baxter. Wow. Oh, yeah. Amazing. I didn't know that. It is, yeah. He signed Jim, Jim Baxter on his first professional form for Wraith Rovers. 
Um, I'm still in Kirkcaldy. It doesn't matter how many books I sell or how many prizes I win. <laughs> That's Jim McDermott's lassie, Ken. <laughs> it's sobering, it's sobering. <laughs> but I'd love to bring Claire um, back into our, our Zoom room because she's got another song that she's picked to sing um, for you, Val. And um, hello again, Claire. Hello, I I'm quite happy listening. This is great. It's <laughs> great, isn't it? <laughs> You crack on, you two. And I'm gun yourself in. Go on. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> but Claire, what song have you picked to, to sing now? And uh, this is a, a wee, it's it. a wee sort of story song uh, for you, Val, and it's called The Widow and the Devil. And uh, she wrong foots him, shall we say. <laughs> shall I crack on? Yes, crack on. Take it away. High atop a lonely moor, a widow lived alone, and in she kept, and as she slept, the pillow heard her moan. For many years a traveller has spent the night with me, but there's no a man in all creation gives content to me. Well, some can manage once or twice, and some make three or four. But it seems to me a rarity is the man who can do more. I'll do anything to find him in heaven or in hell. And as these folks were and as these words were spoken, she heard a front door bell. And the wind blew cold and lonely across that widow's moor, and she never ever turned away a traveller from her door. So boldly ran the widow and the door she opened wide And as she did a tall and handsome stranger stepped inside She gave him bread and brandy and when that he was fed He said my dear now have no fear it's time to come to bed For I've heard your cries way down below and I've come to see you right But you must come to hell with me if I can last the night She said you randy devil to this bargain I'll agree for hell on earth or hell and hell, it's all the same to me. And the wind blew cold and lonely across that widow's moor, and she never ever turned away a traveller from her door. So then they both fell into bed, the devil was working well. He thought before the night was over she'd be in his hell. But when it came to number nine, the widow cried out more. And when the twelfth time came around, the widow cried on core. At twenty-five, the devil felt compelled to take a rest. The widow cried, come raise your head and put me to the test. At sixty-nine, the widow laughed again, again she cried. And the devil said, well, I can see just how your husband died. And the wind blew cold and lonely across that widow's moor. And she never, ever turned away a traveller from her door. At ninety-nine, the devil, he began to wail and weep. He said, I'll give you anything if you let me go to sleep. Before the morning light was up, the devil hobbled home. And the widow, still not satisfied, once more was left alone. Well, she lay there on her pillow, and she thought on ninety-nine. If only that old devil could have made it one more time. I'll call him up again tonight to see what can be done. With a bit more application, he could have made the ton. And the wind blew cold and lonely across that widow's moor, and she never ever turned away a traveller from her door. But when she called to him that night, no devil did appear. For the first time in eternity, the devil he shook with fear. He said, of all the torments I've witnessed here in hell, I never knew what pain was till I rang your front door bell. And the wind blew cold and lonely across that widow's moor, and she never ever turned away a traveller from her door. And the wind blew cold and lonely across that widow's moor, and she never ever turned away a traveller from her door. Fantastic. It's absolutely brilliant. Did you know that song, Val? I don't. That's the first time I've heard that one, but I think the widow must have been a fifer. You know. <laughs> <laughs> From Loch Kelly. <laughs> well, possibly, because, you know, this, do what they say, it takes a long spoon to suck with a fifer. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, she's such a character that uh, the, the widow in that song. It's absolutely fantastic. That narrative, just brilliant. You gave it such gusto, Claire. Fantastic. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it's just it's it's really really wonderful. I mean, yeah, she's just she's front footed and she takes the opportunity and you know she's just um she's very very present and um you know clearly you know if we go deeper there's something there's something lacking something something that she wants and and um but actually she takes them on and i i, I love I, I love the um i love the strength of her and i love the uh, uh she's not trying to be clever she just goes all right then all right then come on then and then Aye, aye, and then he, and then he, I, I love the image. It's always a windy road for some reason. I love the image of him hobbling home. I absolutely love that. And it gives the response to Robert Burns's nine inch will please a lady. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> 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 That's fantastic. Yeah, it's just like that. It's just, I just realised actually we all three are lesbians. I hadn't realised that before. And isn't that interesting? We didn't even speak about it. This is a, this is a wonderful world we're living in now. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that the that, that narrative and story and ballad and song is really what connects us all together, that these are rich characters and that maybe perhaps what draws us into, what draws you into performing a song, Claire, is also the, the character, you know, when you're acting, you you go into the into the person completely. But it seems when you're singing too, you you fully inhabit the role. Yes, I did. I, I just um, uh, all I feel is like I want to if if I like so for example, I love this story. Um, or if I was to do, do you know, Matty Groves, love like lo, lo, love that story, and um, and it's all about just trying to serve to serve the story, but not sort of disengaging. And so like, I can only be, I can only ever be my version of it. And, and, and somebody else will always do their version of it. So all I want to do is try and serve it and, and tell the truth of it. And also if you enjoy, if you connect to it and you enjoy telling the story, then it just makes it very, very easy to, to, to speak to people. It's a bit like saying, um, it would be great if you could hear this because I love it and I want you to love it too. I know well, the truth of it and, and getting to the truth is, is, is also something that we're all interested in because when you write fiction, you're really, it's really important to you to get to some kind of truth all of the time. And it also means that we become fascinated by people who tell lies. Um, and so Val's next poem is a, is a fine example or is kind of inspired by, by one of the world's greatest liars. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh... Uh, a publisher sent me this book, uh, and you know we have to find inspiration in all sorts of strange places. And uh, the beautiful poetry of Donald Trump inspired me and my partner. Uh, it's been a very long time since I wrote poetry, but uh, but this inspired us to a haiku. Poetry of Trump. We keep it in the toilet. It helps us perform. <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> well, you know, you, find, you take your inspiration where you find it, Jackie. I know. And I'm just wondering, you know, what a, what a poet like Norman McCaig would have made of Trump, because Norman McCaig was such a wise man and such a, a keen observer of what was going on in Scotland and around the world. I'm just, you know, I wonder what wry thing he would have had to say. He'd have found something. I, I mean, I always, I always remember that, that great sort of couple of his a poem called uh, Smuggler. It's uh, no one with such luggage has nothing to declare. Yeah, fantastic. And the next poem is by Norman McCaig. It is, yes. Um, and Norman McCaig was, was in many, many ways the poet of, of my teens. Um, I just loved his poetry so much. Um, and uh, I, I, it's the reason why I discovered uh, the northwest of, of Scotland, Sutherland, Assent because he writes so beautifully mm. about that landscape. And, and I was compelled to, to go there. I actually spent most of the summer before I went off to university up there uh, exploring uh, those, those mountains and that, that landscape because of his poetry. Um, and uh, I, I, I just love his work. And when I was a, a baby uh, writer in my teens, when I was trying to write poetry, I did actually send him a couple of my poems. 
And he wrote back to me and he was so nice and so encouraging. Oh. And, and I thought, you must get so, I think, look back at that, I think you must have got so much crap through your letterbox. And he still took the time to write to me and say encouraging and, and, and helpful things to me about, about writing and about poetry. Um, and the poem I've chosen, of, of the many I could have chosen of Norman's poems, uh, is a poem called Truth for Comfort. Truth for Comfort. So much effect, and yet so much a cause. For things crowd close, she is a space to be in. She makes a marvel where a nowhere was. Now she's not here, I make this nowhere one that's her effect, and it becomes a marvel to be more marvellous when her journey's done. Ideas can perch on a nerve and sing. I listen to their singing and discover that she can share herself with everything. This chair, this jug, this picture speak as her, if in a muted way. Is that crazy? My singing mind says no, and I concur. And is this lies for comfort? She won't know, who could not be the cause of lies. For comfort's what I won't need until she has to go. It's such a brilliant poem, uh, that mm. poem, isn't it? And he was very affected by his by his wife's death um, and his life after she, she'd gone. But that poem really, I think, would be a great comfort to to anybody who's experienced that kind of loss, that, 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 that everybody's there somewhere. It reminds me of uh, Douglas Dunn's um, Elegies and yeah. the, the fly that's uh, inside Catherine Mansfield's Bliss um, <clears throat> that was last there when, when his wife had read the book before and that everywhere in a house there's, there's some sign of somebody in, in, in a way. Um, not in a kind of fanciful way that you're saying, but in actually a very yeah. pragmatic, down-to-earth way. Yeah, even if it's just, she bought that vase and I never liked it. <laughs> That's part of the whole, the wholeness of it, you know. It's not about sentiment, it's about honesty. Absolutely. Well, it's been really fantastic having you on Macro to Macro, Val. Really, really wonderful. Uh, and wonderful having you again, Claire. Really fantastic. And I think you're going to, to, to sing us... Um, uh, out in a sense with with Aphon Kiss, but, but before you do that, I would like you to introduce uh, the macker for next week. Next week's macker is Peter Mackay, who is a Gaelic poet. He's from the Isle of Lewis, and he's also a, a member of the Scottish Writers Football Team, uh, which is why the two of us have been in contact lately. He's he's a contributor to an anthology I've been putting together for the Homeless World Cup Day. Uh, it's called Home, Home Fixtures. And he's uh, contributed a couple of poems in Gaelic and English. He's, he's, he's bilingual. And his most recent collection is called Galore. Uh, and I think he'll be a, a great uh, addition to your series, Jackie. So I think he's a fascinating writer. Uh, and the other guest, the other guest uh, next week is Chris McQueer who is a young writer who specialises in short stories. He started off uh, on Twitter telling his stories and he's now had a couple of collections published. He writes in the vernacular Scots uh, and his work has great energy and great humour. So I think you're going to have a great week next week. So Peter, Chris, enjoy yourselves. Oh, thank you, Val. And can you tell us, I mean, you've got wonderful bookshelves behind us. Can you tell us a wee bit about your favourite bookshop, which one you've picked that uh, watchers, viewers can go straight to that bookshop and order your books after they've watched this episode. Well, the bookshop I've chosen is Toppings in Edinburgh, Toppings and Co. Um, and actually, the shelves behind me are the same shelves as they have in the bookshop. Because when I first went to the uh, <laughs> St Andrews branch, I fell in love with the shelves. My partner says I stood there stroking the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> we have to have a house that fits shelves like these. That's I'm really so lovely. This is, our, this is our, our drawing room, which has got lots and lots of bookshelves in it. And Toppings has lots and lots and lots of bookshelves. It's a beautiful bookshop, spacious, a uh, huge range of books. They'll make you a nice cup of coffee. They're friendly. The staff are great. And I've known Robert Topping, who runs the stores, since the early 1990s when he ran Waterstones in Deansgate. And he is a legend among booksellers. He is so supportive of writers. And all of his team are just, like, there for writers. They do so many events, they encourage us, and I just, I just love the shop. Really, he is really fantastic. I remember when he used to be outside protesting, 
in the Waterstones in Manchester and he wore that placard for, for weeks he was there until he actually had his own independent bookshop. But I really admired his tenacity and in these times when people are protesting um, all, all of the time, it's, it's quite, it's a very moving thing, isn't it? The idea that we have to protest for what we believe in. Yes, yes. And uh, it's, it's great to see, you know, sort of the next generation picking up the baton as well. Um, you know, that, you know, I, was, I, I found some old photographs recently in the 1980s uh, when, when I was working in Manchester. And God, half the photographs have got me carrying an NUJ banner through the streets of Manchester protesting about something or other, you know, Section 28 or, or trade union rights or whatever. Um, and, you know, so now, I'm, you know, my son was off at the Black Lives Matter protest. And I think that's good. Baton is being passed on. Yeah, absolutely. Mine was too. And it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it feels satisfying to think. And your wee daughter, Eska, do you think she'll grow up and be on demos? Has she been on one already, Claire? Uh, we went on the, oh no, she, <laughs> I was going to say she, she came on the Women's March with us, but she didn't. She wasn't, she wasn't conceived yet. Um, but she, <laughs> she was there in spirit. Uh, no, she hasn't, um, but she will do. She's, she's already, she's already fought. She, she was only two last week and she's forming her own mind there's it's just a matter of time yeah and we will encourage that all the way you know well it's funny it's amazing to think of it. um we've got an amazing family photograph where my brother is being pushed um aged one and a half by hugh mcdermott on a on a peace protest and uh, i'm kind of jealous because i wish i was a baby that was being pushed by hugh mcdermott but i'm being carried in my mom's arms and it's a great it's a great um family Photograph, but there's so many ways in which we all connect tonight with Fife, with Kirkcaldy in particular, and uh, and with all of these different poems and writers. So thank you so much, and with Burns, thank you so much, Val McDermott and Claire Brown for being on Macker to Macker. And now Val, would you do us the beautiful honour of singing a fun kiss? Aye. And thank you very much for letting me experience an evening of Mackers. <laughs> <laughs> so. <clears throat> A fond kiss, and then we sever. A farewell, alas, forever. Deep in heart, wrung tears, I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans, I'll wage thee. Who shall say that fortune grieves him? While the star of hope she leaves him, me in a cheerful twinkle lights me. Dark despair around benights me. I'll ne'er blame my partial fancy. Nothing can resist my Nancy. For to see her was to love her, love but her, and love forever. Had we never loved so kindly, had we never loved so blindly, never met, nor never parted. We would ne'er been broken hearted. Fear thee, will my first and fairest. Fear thee, will my best and dearest. Thine be ilk a joy and treasure. Peace, enjoyment, love, and pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Val. That was absolutely beautiful. Really lovely. What did you think, Claire? Oh, it's extraordinary. You, you, you tell a story beautifully. It was absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been really lovely having two people sing on Macker to Macker and thank you so much for doing your Green Grow the Rashes Owen and giving it a go and, and singing together because it just felt just really great. It actually made me feel that I was properly with you in, in the room, in the Zoom room as it were. 
It's been great doing this, this series and it's actually been made possible by the help and the support of the National Theatre of Scotland for hosting this, by Edinburgh International Book Festival, by Home Manchester and the School of Arts and Media in Salford University. So I thank all of them very much because it's allowed us to pay and the, the, the poets, the mackers, and, and the singers, and, um, and that seems very important in these particular times. So thank you for joining us and see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.